Hello and welcome. My name is Jonathan Dyer and I am Managing Editor at The World. This is a Facebook Live Q&A about antibody testing and reopening society. With me is Dr. Michael Minner, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology and a core member of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. You can post your question for us on Facebook at Forum, HSPH, and at PRI The World, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. This Q&A is jointly presented by the Forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and The World from PRX and WGBH. Michael, antibody testing has been touted as a key approach to reopening society. Can you just tell us what these tests are and what role they might play in doing that? Sure. I'll, I'll, well, first, I want to say I'm happy to be here. And thanks to everyone who is watching. And, and thanks for joining us. We'll be taking your questions. And uh, hopefully, we'll get to them. Um, so the, the antibody tests are a distinct type of test. A lot of the conversation during this epidemic has been dominated by testing surrounding uh, looking for the virus itself. And that is a metric of, are you, do you have the virus in you right now? Are you infected currently? Uh, antibody tests are a very different type of test. They ask the question, have you had the virus in you in the past? And was it recent or, or was it a longer time ago? And so those are some of the questions that antibody tests are looking for essentially, not for the virus itself, it's looking at your body's immune response or your body's uh, response to the virus. And that immune response in the form of antibodies sticks around in people. Uh, usually it comes up about two, 10, 10 or so days after infection, and then it can last potentially for life in some level. Uh, but of course, there's been a lot of discussion about what those levels of antibodies mean. What, how do we actually interpret the antibody test? But for the purpose of the, of the question, I would say an antibody test is looking to understand has somebody actually been exposed and maybe can we get some information on what, their, what level of protection they have against the virus for the, for the future. And so what have you been finding about the level of virus protection that people might have uh, how long they've, uh, 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 how long ago they might have had the the virus? What level of antibodies there are that you're finding? Yeah. So uh, essentially, we don't yet know how to interpret the level of antibody. We can say with pretty good confidence at this point that we have some tests that are really quite powerful. They're very accurate. Uh, none are going to be a hundred percent accurate. Uh, there's no tests that are a hundred percent accurate uh, for anything really, and. Uh, uh, if you look hard enough, and but but we will but we now have very good tests that we perform in the laboratory, and instead of just giving us a yes no answer, does this person have antibodies or not, we actually have tests that we've some of them we've developed here at Harvard and and elsewhere. Uh, they've been developed by some of the major manufacturers. They can actually give you a quantitative value. They can tell you how much antibody is measured in your blood, and that can be powerful but we have to do the studies first to understand how to use that information. So for example, right now, let's just use fake numbers. If I tell you that if, if somebody gives me two documents, one says that somebody has 50 antibodies and one says that somebody has 500 antibodies, at this moment in time, I won't know how to interpret the level of protection that means. We have to do the studies where we follow people over time who have antibodies and we, we stratify them. We say, this is a group of people of low antibodies and this group of people of high. And then we ask over the next couple of months, for example, what do, do one of those groups get infected and sick again and another one not? And that will help us start to dif differentiate and figure out, are there levels of antibodies above which you're protected and below which you might not be? Uh, I'd just like to get some questions now that are coming in about what the tests can actually tell us. And uh, the, the questions on Facebook are coming in fast and furious. This one uh, is from Felice Frey, who's a healthcare reporter uh, here in Boston, the Boston Globe. Uh, she asks, the city of Boston just announced that testing of representative sampling of asymptomatic Boston residents who were tested both for COVID-19 and for antibodies found that 9.9% .9 had antibodies and 2.6% all asymptomatic tested positive for COVID-19. What conclusions can be drawn from these results? Uh, and do they surprise you? 
So uh, they don't surprise me. I think one thing we have to be very careful about is when we say that we're using representative samples, we have to really understand how representative are the samples and over what populace are they really representative. You can have a representative sample of a, of a nursing home resident in Boston, but that will probably be representative just of nursing homes, for example. So the fact that that found 9% positive in a city like Boston doesn't surprise me uh, very much. We know that this virus has, uh, has gone through quite a lot of people, in particular when we start including nursing home residents who have been hit very hard, when we include uh, homeless shelters. Uh, there's been a lot of these concentrated groups of people that are, that are part of our society where, where positivity rates have gone to 20, 30, 40, 50%. So I, I think that it suggests that the virus has transmitted widely across our population, whether it turns out that the Boston population, if we took everyone, is truly at 9 or 10%, is still up in the air. It could be more like 3 or 4 or 5%. Uh, this question comes in from uh, Marlene at Madison New Jersey Health Department. Uh, she asks, uh, can you explain the significance of positivity rates in current diagnostic testing? I was told that the WH goal is 20%. Uh, I think the, the, the diagnostic testing, meaning the uh, antibody test, or... That's my understanding of the question. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the 20% 20, what the 20 is getting at, actually. Um, can you repeat the question? Maybe I'll... Yeah, she says, would you explain the significance of positivity rates in current diagnostic testing? I was told the WH goal is 20%. Um, so she might actually be asking about... Um, uh, testing of whether someone actually currently has COVID-19. Yeah, so I, I would say that we we have to, when we look at the positivity rates and what we're trying to uh, achieve, um, if we're if we're using the positivity rate in the population as we're as a metric for knowing how many people do we want to to be testing. So, for example, if we test everyone right now for the virus, uh, we will probably have probably less than 1% at any given time will actually have the virus in them. Uh, but, uh, but what we know about the way that testing is performed for the virus, it actually, we tend to select for people who are, are uh, symptomatic. So are, despite the fact that we might have 1% or less of the population positive for the virus at the moment, if we actually look at the, at the percent positive that is tested, it's oftentimes above 10, 15, and, and 20% in Boston, for example. Um, but that doesn't mean that 20% of all Boston people are positive with the virus. That just is a reflection of, of who we're testing. And I think actually the lower the rate is, that, then that indicates that we're testing generally a more broad and a less skewed population. So maybe that's getting at the answer there. I'm not quite positive. Okay, as, as we've actually drifted onto COVID-19 uh, testing, it might actually be a, a point to uh, go to get to this question from Daniel Chang, uh, who, uh, who says that Florida began, Florida began offering serology testing at state-run test sites this last week. The testing capacity is 100 a day at four drive through sites in South Central and South and Northern Florida. How many people a day will a state like Florida with a population of 21 and a half million have to test in order for researchers to understand the prevalence of the virus in the population and to safely reopen businesses and public spaces. So the number of people that need to be tested is going to be very dependent on how well you're testing, how, how representative the pool of people is that you are testing. So you can go and test a million people, but if they don't represent the other 20 million people, then you've then then that's not enough tests you have to so I would say that you have to um, have at the very least the way that we are approaching this question here we're trying to find we're trying to use very good databases some databases that are that are are developed for example by economists and for political reasons we're trying to leverage these databases to construct a very representative cohort of the population and test that small cohort, relatively small cohort, a few thousand people. Uh, we can then use that as our base of understanding sort of baseline positivity rates across these different spectra and use that to calibrate uh, the biases, to understand better the biases that might happen when we go in and test much larger swaths of the population in a less robust fashion in terms of finding representativeness. And so 
Uh, if you do it well, you can actually get a, get away with testing in the low thousands or maybe 10,000 people for a state like Florida and get a pretty good understanding of what the, what the seroprevalence is. But if you don't design those studies well, you might, you might really be uh, way off the mark despite testing you know, tens of thousands of people. Sure. If we can just get back to antibodies and antibody testing, once you, once you begin to de- learn all this information about the level of antibodies in someone's blood and, and what that might mean uh, for their uh, ability to, to become reinfected or infect someone else, what, what, what do you do with that information beyond just understanding what has happened to an individual person or a group of people? Is there a way that this could actually help us combat uh, th- this new coronavirus. Absolutely. So I, I think that I think the real strength of testing for antibodies lies in the public health aspect of uh, of the data, not so much in the individual health. It's good for people to know their zero status, I suppose. But where it's really the the most power is understanding where are the populations, for example, that have uh, the greatest amount of immunity built up versus the least. So we could take two extreme, we could take an extreme example and um, New York City is sort of uh, in the US anyway, becoming an extreme example. Uh, there's, if we go and do serological testing, we might find a few weeks ago it was 20%, it might be 25% or so. So what we can do is we can actually look uh, in different communities and we can say this community or this nursing home or this city uh, has let's say in a, in a few more months or a year from now, has 70% uh, of their population is seropositive. That's important information to know because you, you can figure out how to best allocate resources to, for public health needs and know where do you need to do the most enhanced surveillance. If a community has already reached herd immunity, which no, no communities have in, in large part so far, but if they do, then that's an extreme example of where maybe you don't have to put so much enhanced surveillance there and actually focus on the places where there's a big immunity gap, where there's very few people who have been exposed yet. And you might really want to worry about those as being the next place where you might see a big outbreak. So that's one way you can use it to sort of allocate resources and develop risk profiles for communities to understand where might there be a big outbreak in the future and where might there be less risk in the future as well. So you're fairly confident that the presence of, of antibodies would actually confer a fairly high degree of immunity? I think that this isn't going to be a virus that um, that goes against, uh, that the, where the immune response to this virus goes against everything we know about uh, viral immunity. HIV was one virus where that kind of really changed our perspective of what having antibodies looks like. But for the most part, acute respiratory viruses like this, uh, the kinetics follow what other respiratory viruses that we've seen. I think uh, despite the fact that we don't have good solid data yet uh, from individual level data, I think most most immunologists and physicians and epidemiologists, uh, myself included, assume that people will develop some level of immunity. We don't know what, we don't know if it will be perfect immunity probably not, or if it will be partial immunity, maybe they can still get some infection, but it might not be severe the second time around. And we don't know if that might happen within a few months of having been exposed the first time, or maybe maybe immunity wanes over a year or two. And then on the third year after your first infection, you can get mildly sick again. So we have to figure out what all of this means. But I think in general, we, we will see that people do develop and immune response that is at least partially protective, but probably it won't be a very robust protection like we see with measles, for example. It will probably be somewhere in between uh, where, we, where we get some partial immunity. And where do you stand on recommending whether, whether people should go and get their own uh, antibody uh, test, which there are hundreds out there, uh, it's, it's fairly easy to get done. Uh, what is the value in knowing your own status or the risk that uh, you could actually maybe uh, um, not be as protected as you think you are. Yeah, I think actually at the moment, the individual, um, the, the real, like I said a moment ago, the power of the antibody testing is really in the public health databases and public health sphere. The, an individual getting an antibody result back to them at, the, at this moment in time, I think can give them some peace of mind that they, if they thought they were infected in the past, then, then they can confirm that. But I, I really do um, still 
uh, warn that that there's not that we don't know yet at an individual level just what the risk of reinfection is uh, and how protected or not somebody might be. We have to do the studies to really understand what level of partial immunity people might have after being infected. Can they still get an infection? And, and in particular, even if they're not getting an infection that causes themselves to feel very ill a second time around, my, one of my big concerns is that people might get an antibody result back that's positive. They might throw away the mask and go see grandma and grandpa in the nursing home not recognizing that just having an antibody positive uh, test does not necessarily mean that you can't still acquire the virus again and transmit it on to grandma and grandpa in the nursing home or, or elsewhere. And so I think that we have to really have the messaging for the public be very clear about how to interpret their antibody tests if we're going to start be giving these back to people. This question has come from Facebook on that topic. Uh, is there a role for someone's physician in interpreting antibody test results, uh, including knowing what a patient's medical history is or might have been? I think the, the physicians, what they can do at this point in time, uh, I would say that the role for physicians is to explain to people all the caveats, that explain to their patients the caveats that come along with having an antibody at this moment. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get the infection again. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can't spread the, the virus to somebody else if you get exposed again. Uh, and, it, it does, and so I think that at the moment, with the data that we have in hand, physicians, we're all, we're all sort of in the same position. We're waiting for our studies, for the various studies that are ongoing to come out with some results that can give us some better understanding. In the, in the, hopefully in a, within the next few months, we'll have some first data sets that come out from these studies where we'll actually be able to say to, uh, if a physician gets a report back, maybe it will be something like, yes, this person is positive for the antibodies, but is below the level of needed for good protection uh, or is above the level of needed for good protection. We're hoping to find what that level might be, but at the moment, we just don't know it. Uh, this question has come in from Cindy McCormick of the Cape Cod Times. Uh, with the coronavirus being so new, uh, is it even possible for antibody tests to be sensitive and specific enough to provide adequate information for individuals being tested? Aren't there a lot of false positives that could put people who believe they're protected in jeopardy? Absolutely. And that's why we have to ensure that any of the antibodies that we are using are, uh, uh, any of the antibody tests that we are using are the uh, are a very high grade tests that are that are really cutting down on the numbers of false positives and and false negatives there will still be false positives even hiv tests which are very good and very specific get false positives and so we have to uh, always interpret antibody tests in the context of clinical care and uh, and it might even be worthwhile uh, doing what we do with hiv for example where we actually do two different antibody tests. If somebody's positive, we confirm it with a second antibody test that's looking for a different antibody, but also against HIV. So that might be a direction that we go where it's one, one test alone might not be sufficient. Whether we really need that for an acute viral infection is a different question. Um, but I think we have to, the, the, I, I wanna make it clear that having some tolerance for a false positive and a false negative is normal in clinical laboratory medicine. It's just that we don't want those numbers to be big. We don't want it to be 2% of all positives are false. That's, not, that's, a, that's an intolerable number, uh, I, I think, for, for these tests. We wanna have it to be smaller than that. And some tests are, are that good and some of them are not. So I would say, talk to your physician if you wanna know which kind of tests you're, you're getting. Uh, is there a role for the FDA and the CDC in, in refining the, 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 the narrowing down the sort of hundreds of tests that are out, out there right now? Absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, the, the FDA came in a little bit late here to try to um, contain the numbers of tests. And now they're doing it. And, and a lot of the tests that were materializing on the, mar on the commercial market are now being kind of withdrawn. Um, I definitely think that there's a lot of room for the FDA and CDC to come in and, and create pretty clear guidelines and metrics. There's a lot of people getting into this space who um, have maybe never dealt with antibody tests before, but now have decided to take it upon themselves to become uh, an antibody tester. 
uh, or an antibody testing facility. And for, you know, for, for those of us who spend our lives um, studying antibodies and testing antibodies, you know, that's, we see a lot of the problems inherent there, but we also see that there's a need and a space for a lot of people to join in to help with the cause. And I think that if that is done safely, it really needs FDA to create guidelines, to create metrics that need to be achieved, which they're doing. And also what I would really throw out there for the FDA is to, and the CDC is to create very well structured panels of, of, uh, of blood specimens, for example, that a new facility that wants to start testing has to um, uh, request this panel of, of samples and has to pass all the validations of those samples in a blinded fashion, for example, to, to be able to start offering their test. That might be one way to, one way to go. Uh, this question has come in online from Philip, uh, who says, the Broad Institute shared progress on a new CRISPR-based test that potentially could be used by folks at home, much like a pregnancy test. Is this a test, is this a test for, for active COVID and antibody test or some combination of the two? Do you see this RNA-based testing as potentially fruitful? Uh, absolutely. I, I know all about the, that test. And I think um, at-home testing for the virus, whether it's looking for the antigen or whether it's looking for the RNA of the virus, uh, those, are, those are going to be powerful tests to have. Uh, more so even than the antibody tests, because that those the the, the more the the quicker you get your results of having of being currently infected with the virus, the quicker you can act uh, on that information. Whereas just knowing the antibody data, again, I think that's better if that lives within the public health domain, and it, and the they're not as time sensitive. Getting this virus information is crucial, and if we can get those tests to people in their homes so that they don't have to go to a physician's office and infect somebody else by mistake, uh, that's great. I do think that these CRISPR-based assays, these tests will, uh, will get there. I think that they will be useful for this. There will also be potentially paper strips that look like little pregnancy tests uh, that will look for antigen. So we're going to see in the next few months a lot of these different, um, these different tests for the virus itself or pieces of the virus will start to become increasingly available in new formats uh, and, and they will be uh, very important. The challenge will be to make sure that the data, if somebody is positive, that there's some clear way for that individual who tests themselves at home to let the Department of Public Health know that they're positive so that it can, uh, so that contact tracing and outbreak uh, uh, sort of mitigation can take place. We've had a couple of questions come in around international efforts on this. Um, uh, uh, this writer says, I understand that Israel and Germany are both attempting to do antibody testing on a representative national sample. Uh, can you tell us about those efforts, how these countries are executing them and how they hope to use the results? Yeah, everyone wants to know how widely has this infection, has this virus spread within their communities or their countries? Spain just came out uh, with a, a, a very large study of over 60,000 people uh, where, they, where they found somewhere between 4 and 6% of the population has been infected. So these are crucial numbers to get. The U.S. is a very large country, so getting one number for the whole country is going to be difficult. We'll probably see it happen city by city and state by state. Uh, but the way that these numbers are used is to understand, again, where... Uh, where we are in terms of our risk um, as a community. If we found, for example, that 50% of the United States was already infected, I want to be clear that that's not a reasonable number, but let's, if 50% was, then all of a sudden that really changes how we think about the future risk in terms of outbreaks and, and the size and, and what we need to do to prepare. Uh, more likely, we'll, we'll find that as a country we're below 5%. And having that information is important for us to know, both to understand how quickly did this virus transmit through the community. 5% is still very, still millions of people, uh, if that's what it ends up being. And uh, so we'll have to understand, you know, how quickly did it spread? And what's the risk going forward? How much pre exist how much immunity is there? And are we anywhere close to herd immunity? And at this point, I think, New York City is probably the, the closest major metropolitan area to getting to herd immunity, and it's still not even halfway there. It's, uh, you know, but it might be at around 20 or 25 percent. 
we might need around 70% to achieve herd immunity or population level immunity. So these, these types of antibody screens of the population are crucial for public health just to know where things are at and know how to allocate resources appropriately. So can you see a time when herd immunity uh, will, will be around for COVID-19? I think so. Uh, it's probably not going to be a very long time, though. I think we, we whether it's perfect herd immunity or, or just like the seasonal coronaviruses, there's a lot of immunity out in the population already for each of these seasonal coronaviruses. There's four strains that normally um, circulate in the, in, the, in, the, in the world. And, uh, and so there is some level of herd immunity with those because people started getting them as babies and the whole population has essentially been exposed to those strains. Uh, it will take a while for us to get there. And um, many people are hoping that it's going to be a vaccine instead of the infection. You know, I, I hope that as well. Uh, you know, that will get us to herd immunity quicker without having to get everyone infected. I think over years, though, we will, we will achieve herd immunity, but it might be a very long slog to, to get there. Um, another question coming online about international efforts. Uh, a number of countries... Uh, starting with Chile, are looking at using immunity passports to allow people with COVID-19 antibodies to go back to their lives as normal. Um, what's your approach on this? I know the WHO has warned against it. Uh, it's the idea that you could have maybe a, a wristband or an app on your phone or something that would say, oh, I've got COVID-19 antibodies. I'm free to go, as it were. What's your take on that? Yeah, this, still, this comes back to the same question that we still don't really understand what is the role of having an antibody uh, test positive for somebody. Does it mean that they can't transmit? Does it mean that they can transmit? Uh, so until we understand more about what, you know, and this also pertains to how we can achieve herd immunity or not, um, you know, until we understand more about how to interpret these antibody tests, I think the, the term immunity passport uh, suggests, suggests, I think, to the average person that something that we don't know yet. It, it suggests that, that you're probably truly immune, and we just don't know if that's the case. So I would say, you know, we might put people in different risk bins. You know, maybe if, you've no, if you have no antibodies and you've never been exposed, you're, you're in a, a high-risk category for being exposed. And if you have very high antibodies, maybe you're at a slightly lower risk, but it doesn't mean you're immune for sure. And, and we really have to just do the, the science to figure that out. Um, and just speaking of risk bins, this uh, question is coming on Facebook from Amanda. Uh, what is your medical opinion on schools opening in the fall? Uh, well, I think, uh, I think there's two ways to look at the question. We, you know, it's another unknown still is how, how much our children contributing to the transmission chains uh, of this virus. And I think that we have to be careful and very cautious about opening schools again. At the same time, we have to be pragmatic. Having schools closed down is one of the most socially disruptive things that a society can do. Adults rely on their children being at school in order to carry out their normal work day. So there has to be a balance and I think the conversation really has to start being about balancing uh, public health from an infectious disease lens and public health from an economic and social lens. The, the thing that we don't wanna find ourselves in is we, we don't wanna find ourselves looking back and recognizing that the, the shutdowns and the economic catastrophe that came from that ultimately kills more people and younger people than, than the virus would have alone unmitigated. So we need to figure out how to balance these and thinking about what are the risks associated with opening schools is a central component of that. We, we need to do the studies right now and some places they are ongoing to understand are kids transmitting and are they, if they're transmitting amongst each other, do they bring it home to their parents? And what does that mean for the risk to their parents? And, and we have to take all of this information that we don't yet have uh, fully into account to, to really understand these questions. Um, I just want to just get one more question in about uh, antibodies. Is there, a, is there an opportunity and how, a, 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 what kind of research has been done on how, when we, when we know about antibodies, it could potentially use not just uh, sort of a, a, for epidemiological research, but also to, as a potential uh, treatment? 
Yeah, uh, so neutralizing antibodies and therapeutic antibodies are actually used all the time. We've we've been learning a lot about antibodies over the last you know decade or two and how to harness them because they can be very powerful tools to uh, treat uh, infectious diseases, cancers, all the all these different things. Antibodies are actually very good for. And uh, for example, there's antibodies against the, the, the childhood virus called RSV uh, that, that seem to work very well. So I think that you know, if I were placing bets on where, where, what type of therapeutic agent might come first, I, I do think that the first really effective therapeutic agent might be antibodies that are produced in a factory, you know, in a company, they're manufactured and somebody either takes it as an IV or a pill, you know, however people get the antibodies in is going to be up to the companies to create the right pathway. Um, but there, we're already seeing, uh, there's some news out recently that there are some antibodies that seem to be somewhat protective or that look like they might be promising in terms of killing the virus or neutralizing it in a Petri dish in the lab. And if those turn out to be safe to give to humans, like maybe these can actually be therapies or transition into therapies to give to sick people in the ICU, for example. So I feel, I feel um, optimistic about the role of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies as neutralizing agents for this virus. And what's your educated guess on what kind of timeline we're looking at for that? Uh, it depends who hits, who strikes gold. You know, it's, if you can, so finding the right antibody, um, can be a really, uh, uh, it can be like searching for, uh, you know, a needle in a haystack or, but if you find it, you know, you might really find a, a, a good one. And we've had, we've increased our ability to screen huge numbers of, of cells and anti potential antibodies uh, in, the, in the laboratory in a way that uh, uh, really improves efficiency and time to discovery. And I, I think, Maybe by the end of the year, we will actually have some pretty good candidates. Maybe by the end of the summer, we'll have some good candidates that actually start being put into animals and then humans uh, to, for trials. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time, uh, Michael. But before we do, um, I just want to get a one final question. Uh, in your assessment, when will we see full testing in place that will enable us to safely re-enter society and get back to something that we can recognize as normal? I think to get full testing in place. So the way that I interpret that question uh, and what I would like to see is if we, if we really wanted to get, uh, have an approach that I thought was approaching safe, you know, to really mitigate any outbreaks as they start and get society back and running, I'd want to see something that approaches most people in the world, or at least, you know, let's focus on the U S since we're here at the moment. If we can get most people in the U S a test in their hand that they can use every day. Uh, so these would be cheap tests, maybe pennies or doll, you know, a dollar a piece that's supplied by the government. Uh, that's somebody, it's a paper strip that you spit onto, for example, every day um, you put some saliva on it and it tells you that day, are you positive or negative? Uh, I think that that would be the type of real change in the type of testing we need to to have a very safe way to get businesses back w without running the risk of large outbreaks. And, you know, it sounds a little bit futuristic, the day when everyone can have a test in their pocket every day, uh, but I don't think we're that far off. There's a lot of companies just here in Boston and California and elsewhere uh, around the world that are developing really simple tests that are just essentially little pieces of paper with some compounds on them that can detect the virus. and Theoretically, you could produce these paper strips for uh, in the millions uh, for very cheap. And, and so I think that it will take one of the, like a, a leap to, to these new types of testing technologies to get there. But I think that that could potentially happen in the, you know, there's some of them will be coming out. We'll see them in the next few months, I think. Maybe not to everyone, but we'll see them be trialed in the next few months. That sounds exciting. Uh, and it concludes uh, our Facebook discussion. Thank you again, Michael, for... Uh, building everyone's questions. Uh, this Q&A has been jointly presented by the form at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the world from PRX and WGBH. You can view the full discussions on our Facebook pages and send feedback at forum, HSPH, and at PRI The World. Let's keep the conversation going. <laughs>